Welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program, Accelerating Transformation, Lessons in Business Resiliency. I'm Scott Bowden, Managing Director at Accenture, responsible for a North America software and platforms industry practice, and I'm pleased to moderate today's executive panel discussion. To learn more about the club and its programs, please visit commonwealthclub.org. Just over six months ago, the Bay Area and U.S. economies were thrown into a tailspin because of the global pandemic. Since the original shelter-in-place orders were issued, first in the Bay Area, then across the country, we have seen profound impacts in society, consumers, employees, and businesses overall. Tens of millions of workers found themselves working from home, some for the very first time. At the same time, the companies that employed these workers needed to transform themselves almost overnight into all virtual organizations using cloud and new tools to reach customers and manage employees. Long-term trends and changes anticipated over the next few years have occurred in the space of a, of a few mere weeks, forcing companies to rapidly adapt. Industries are being shaped in real time. Many companies have started their journey towards recovery, and we've learned from some of our recent Accenture research, C-suite research, that leaders are ready to reinvent their businesses. In fact, 74% of executives plan to completely rethink their processes and operating models to be more resilient going forward. And 92% are accelerating investments in digital transformation. We, as consumers and employees, are now thinking and living differently. We're buying differently. And our research informs us that the habits formed will endure beyond this crisis, permanently changing what we value, how and where we shop, and how we live and work. I'm joined today by senior leaders from Bay Area companies of various industries and sizes to further explore these topics. And I'm very excited to introduce our special guests on the panel. First, we've got Sally Gilligan, Chief Information Officer and Head of Strategy for Gap. We have Everett Harper, CEO and co-founder of Trust, a technology consulting company. And Karen Mangia, Vice President, Customer and Market Insights at Salesforce, as well as a recent author of the book, Working From Home, Making the New Normal Work For You. So before we start a discussion, a quick note, if you have any questions for me or any of the panelists, please post them in the YouTube chat box or on the Facebook comment section, and the questions will be forwarded to me throughout the program. We'll attempt to get as, to as many of them as possible. Okay, well, let's begin. Um, so first, how about we do a round of more formal introductions here uh, and have each of our panelists talk a bit about yourself and your role, and then perhaps flash back six months or so when we were first hit by the pandemic and maybe talk a bit about how did your organization respond how do you sustain your workforce and your services? And how do you start to navigate through some of that uncertainty to date? Uh, perhaps Sally, can we start with you? Great, thanks Scott. So first, just by way of introduction, as Scott mentioned, I head up both our technology globally for Gap Inc. That's our portfolio of companies. Many of you are probably familiar with Gap, Old Navy, Banana Republic, and Athleta, our women's active brand. In addition to that, I also head up strategy for the portfolio of our companies. And so the nexus of those two roles has been quite interesting as we've navigated this period over the past couple of months. And if I go back six months, I think and everyone on this call would probably agree, it seems a lot longer <laughs> than it actually is, just relative to what we've all been navigating. Um, we were fortunate in the sense that we do run a sizable operation in China, and we had a little bit of learning, albeit not much, but a couple weeks as they had to do early response. And we had the opportunity to learn from our teams on the ground there that did a remarkable job around how they thought about safety, first and foremost. And that was really when you looked at our decision criteria and what we went through as a company, it was really first and foremost, what is the safety of our customers? What is the safety of our employees? And how do we react first um, through that? And so it was a series of really difficult decisions. Um, and it, for a period of time, we did make the decision that we did have our stores closed globally, worldwide. Um, and that was first and foremost to make sure that everything was safe until we understood the situation um, better. We then, you know, immediately back to the comment of, you know, what is your business response plan? you know, stopped and engaged at a local level with who were all the different organizations, authorities, experts that could help us. Because as you're managing a global operation, you know, the pandemic was unfolding across the globe in different ways um, and different communities impacted. And so taking the time to understand what was a safe environment, what wasn't a safe environment, how did you make sure not only what are the protocols, but did people feel safe? 
And so starting with, um, first and foremost, how do we enable our employees? And so we did move to a global um, workforce that was working remotely um, from all of our um, headquarter employee perspective. And we were fortunate, as you mentioned, we have been on a path of a digital transformation and we had the infrastructure in place, you know, and we're mindful that many organizations necessarily didn't have that resource, but we were able to take our employees remote with a number of um, productivity tools and that was relatively smooth for us. That having been said, we create physical products, we create experiences for our customer. And so how you do that creative um, aspect really required us to think differently. How do we enable that for our designers in particular? Um, and for those of you that touch, um, those of our employees that touch product. And then we slowly went through a process of saying, what does safe look like? Um, and really went through some very deep protocols, both within our stores, making sure that if we were going to invite customers and employees back in, they both felt safe. Um, and we really worked very hard with different experts on how you do that, what you put in place, and also how do you communicate that to your customers first and foremost. So it was their decision and they understood um, what we had taken on, how we were approaching it. So those are just some of the thoughts. I will stop there and give Karen and Everett a chance to comment, but it was quite a lot um, back to back because not only did you go from immediate response but you also then had a shift in how do you recover from that immediate response. Thanks, Sally. I, I, I agree with you. I, when I did the math and realized it was six months, at least in the Bay Area, it, it, it feels much longer, I think, for all of us. So thank you. Uh, Everett, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so Everett Harper, uh, co-founder, CEO of Trust, and um, we... Um, are one of the few companies we went remote first about eight years ago. Um, and we founded uh, the company with that in mind. And um, in some ways we were on the edge then, and now we're sort of in the center of thinking about um, working from home and so forth. And we have a lot of playbooks and practices that we developed over time with lots of mistakes and experiments um, until we sort of were able to come up with uh, uh, patterns and processes that we could support uh, people. Um, what we do is we design, build, and deliver software, custom software that solves really complex problems for public agencies, um, as well as uh, large enterprises. Um, it enables them to have better outcomes for their customers. And uh, we've been able to participate in things like fixing healthcare.gov back in 2015, um, helping build core supply chain systems to help military families move all, uh, around the world. And that has you 15% of all US moves. So it's a very complicated system, complex system, I should say. And then um, working with um, uh, organizations in the private sector, such as accelerating infrastructure for healthcare companies, um, all of which are um, in many ways helping companies do that transformation. And what we're seeing and hearing is as uh, as was mentioned earlier, that's accelerating because people are making decisions. They may have thought, oh, maybe we should wait a year. It was like, nope, it's right now. Um, and I think one of the things that we uh, take uh, very much into account um, is sort of a human-centered approach to these things. And the interaction between, it's not just the software, it's the interaction between the people and the operations and these systems and the software that make for these changes to be both difficult, but if done well, can actually be an accelerant to, to businesses. Um, I think the other thing I'd say just is uh, in terms of uh, uh, the size of the company, we're about 105 people um, in 30 different states um, and 45% women and uh, over 35% uh, underrepresented minorities, um, which is pretty rare for a tech company. And it reflects the fact that we can recruit and we can engage with people all across the country because we know talent is not just located in the Bay Area. So with all those people across these states, how are we going to like figure out how to stay connected? Well, the good news is we had a lot of these systems in place um, and communications and then practices and culture. So the first thing was we gathered all our, um, our work uh, in doing distributed uh, practices. And we shared, we got them into one place and we shared them with our clients. We put them on our website, shared it freely um, in a couple of blog posts to kind of say, hey, here's how you make this transition and here's the lessons that we've learned. It's really focused on staying connected. And I think that was said earlier as well. That's the first, that was the first thing. The second thing is we found, formed a COVID uh, response team 
um, four of the leaders, two focused on internal, how our company, how our organization doing and how our employees doing, and the other external, how are our clients doing, what's the macro environment. And then it's just a process of learning quickly because we didn't pretend that we knew what was going on, but we had to figure it out quickly. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll say is that we in implemented a bunch of policies that enabled people to be human. So we said, you know what, people are going to be 20% less productive right off the bat. Let's just call that flat. Second, we're going to have interruptions from kids and pets and so forth. And then how do we reduce the fear that that's actually going to be looked at badly? We said, no, that's not, that's not important. In fact, our interviewing has that right up, on, up front is, hey, don't worry about the interruptions. I know you're nervous enough. Um, and then um, last, we canceled our offsite. We had an offsite planned in, in, um, in New Orleans and then realized that the opportunity existed that we could do this virtually. So we're doing three offsites virtually in the course of three months for about three hours each. And we're going to see how that works. How can we gather people in a way that makes them 3D, but also respects the fact that we can't gather in person and see if we can make that warm and interesting. Don't Fantastic. Stop yeah, no, that's, that, that's a lot. Uh, you had an eight year jump start, it sounds like. So, uh, a lot of learnings along the way. Uh, Karen, how about you? Well, I will never forget the time when a mysterious calendar invite changed everything. I don't know if this happens to you. You receive a calendar invite from someone you know, and so you accept it. And when it gets close to the meeting, you start to wonder what's on the agenda. And in my case, that calendar rotation happened the beginning of March. And it was titled Ohana at Home, which is, you know, Ohana meaning family. We use that phrase at Salesforce quite frequently. And at home, meaning part of our at home workforce, uh, which I've been a part of because I spend so much time traveling. And I thought this sounds familiar. And the people who sent the invite are our executive who leads real estate services, and one of our senior executives from employee engagement. And as the meeting got closer, I was getting curious, like, why are there only three other people and myself in this conversation with these two very senior executives? And it was such a relief to join the call and discover that the other meeting attendees looked as confused as I did. <laughs> and the script that ensued was, congratulations, you are now our global work from home task force. And what we're going to do today is stay on this call as long as it takes. Now, mind you, it was only a 30 minute meeting block. So that news came as a surprise. We're gonna stay on this call as long as it takes to build a plan to send all of our employees around the world at home simultaneously. They're gonna work there. And I remember thinking, is that really going to happen? I mean, we have a beautiful tower in San Francisco. We have wonderful real estate. We love to be together with people in person. And just like all of you, you know, we were wrapping our minds around what would that look like? And it's after I got over the initial shock of, is this really going to happen? Followed by, I wonder how many meetings I should clear because it looks like we might be here for a while. An interesting thought sunk in. I thought, oh, this is great. I mean, the first time I gave an interview about working from home was 2002. I mean, I've, I've been a remote worker for forever. This will be just like riding a bike. The only difference is, you know, you might think you know how to ride a bike and I thought so too, but do you know how to ride a bike when the ground around you is shifting, everything is moving and you're living in this perpetual time warp? I found out that even though I had done this for a long time, it wasn't at all like riding a bike because what had shifted was besides everything, uh, substantially right the context in which we were trying to take our technology and our skills and our focus on people uh, and really operate in a new context with that. So as that time played out, you know, we're a large technology organization and as a large technology organization, we tend to have employees who are comfortable using technology. And it wasn't so much about, you know, helping people figure out the best camera or monitor or desk chair to help them be comfortable and productive working at home. It was a little bit about what Everett mentioned, which is how do we care for the human side of this experience, you know, for our own employees, customers, and partners first. 
So we created a series. Uh, it's called Camp Be Well Together. And the idea was create a 30-minute wellness break each day that we would broadcast and feature a range of experts from leading medical officials who could give us up-to-date information and answer our questions, to Jane Goodall sharing the potential effects on building a more sustainable future. Uh, We've had athletes on doing little workout programs with us, monks doing guided meditation. The idea was, how do we insert a purposeful pause and join together in the experience of being well? And then within that, and kind of at the same time, we took our own strategic planning framework that we use each year because, surprise, guess who got all of their New Year's resolutions wrong this year? Everyone. And every business plan is really off this year as well, right? So we thought, how could we take some of those prioritization tools and really as a company define what success looks like in the next really just three months? So abandon that year-long success and priority approach and really think just in the next few months. And and we encouraged our employees to do that on a personal level as well. I mean, hey, who do you want to evolve to become as a result of this? How do you want to change as a leader or a parent or a partner or whatever that looks like in your world? So I think there was a focus there first on caring for the people. What that gave way to is how can we really activate what we talk about in our culture? You know, these values of trust and customer success, you know, and our core focus on innovation and really activate that to bring some products to market very quickly that help people navigate this during this period of time. So for us, a big pivot was bringing products to market like work.com and Salesforce Anywhere that give people the tools to either slowly return to the office safely um, or bring people, you know, back into community safely or help them get the information that they need securely from anywhere. You know, and even with all that said, just as, as kind of Sally and Everett had highlighted, this is a very agile process. And, you know, in any given day, week or month, how we make sure someone's not being left behind or feeling invisible or, you know, doing this kind of work that leads to burnout and overwork that we're staying conscious you know, of how to be agile and adapt to those very, very changing circumstances and staying close to, you know, what people really need. Got it. Uh, Well, thank you. There's a lot in there. Uh, I hope we can explore here as as we go through and and maybe just to to pivot forward a little bit. um, So we've been through this, these six months here, we talk about business resiliency um, perhaps what we can do is sort of maybe further define what is business resiliency in the context of a few different, I guess, vectors. I, and first and foremost would be around the resiliency of our consumers and our customers. I know Accenture just did a bit of research um, and we talked about, Sally, you talked a bit about this, but you know, we saw that there has been an 11% increase in e-commerce globally in just the past matter of months. That's equivalent to the same shift over the last 10 years, right? Uh, we're also seeing a 51% increase in the use of contactless payments methods, and people are going to continue to use that going forward. Um, so, so maybe, Sally, let's start with you. Yeah, obviously, Gap is a leader, a global leader in the retail industry, which was probably one of the most impacted industries here as we think through it. You know, physical stores are shut down or operating with limited capacity. You know, what are some things that you're hearing from your customers that are different? What's the new demand signals? And uh, what has worked for Gap in being able to respond to those? No, it's a great question, Scott. And, um, you know, we are fortunate we run quite a significant digital business. And so we were able to pivot and really um, capture where our customer wanted to go. And we, you know, I think it was said really well, we want to be, at the end of the day, we want to be where our customer is and what he or she needs and where we need to go. And so it not only was it enough to run a digital business, and I think you said it very well, what we've seen with COVID and the pandemic is not a new trend, but a more definitive shift in the trend and acceleration of the trend. And so the ability to pivot our business and our innovation towards that, it's included a spectrum of what we call omni experiences and services um, for our customer. So starting first and foremost, um, you know, we've almost seen double the amount of online business with that shift and making sure we could still fulfill and meet our customer demand. And, you know, we were lucky. We went through a very significant automation of our distribution and fulfillment capabilities, which allowed us to do that. But also marrying that back up with first and foremost, our employee safety 
and the protocols inside all those buildings and making sure the spacing and the density and everything was in compliance, that it was truly safe. Um, so it's that fine balance. And I like the word that Karen used a lot, which is, you know, you're learning every day. It's agile, right, as you go through it and as the environment's changing. But in addition to that, um, some things that have really helped us out, we rolled out curbside. And what's been a silver lining in all of this has been the innovation and the empowerment of teams. When we say to teams, this is the problem we have and this is what we need to go solve and to watch people really come together around that has been a really an amazing part of the culture. And so as an example, we brought our curbside capability to our customer in just two weeks and being able to have them go and pick up and need and really a contactless experience as well. Um, like you said, contactless payments, um, we had parts of that. We accelerated the rest of it and ensuring that our customer could understand that and interact with us. Um, and I, I could go on and on. Those are some of the highlights and probably some of the biggest ones. In addition, and even just small ones, using some really great new technology around store density. So we knew how many people were in the store. We could comply with all the rules locally, um, temperature checking at our headquarter buildings. And you know all of that came to bear in a fairly um, very quick period of time, but it's been really exciting to see how that's really enabled um, our customers' experiences and our employees' ability to meet those experiences. That's impressive. And I'm sure some of those changes are going to be here to stay, right? As yeah. into the future. And that's what we see is a lot of them are, um, frankly, just building on things that our customer wanted anyway, in terms of convenience or in terms of ability and flexibility. And so making sure that we're doing them in such a way that we can sustain them over time. And it's been a really great learning. Um, and it's also been really fun to see the innovation across the organization. Great. Now, Karen, you know, Salesforce uh, pretty much created the industry around customer success a decade or so ago, right? Uh, you're sitting within customer and market insights. Uh, you touched on work.com, which is Salesforce's uh, really sort of set of tooling or clouds uh, to enable some of this. I guess, how are you continuing to maintain uh, some of this customer loyalty and acquire new customers in this period where we don't have people out in the field and engaging with, with customers directly? You know, what's critical is being able to have conversations and really meet our different customers where they are, right? Sally was making such a great point about where people are in their digital journey. And the reality is, you know, we have some customers who, you know, had a digital transformation strategy in place or, or operated a big percentage of their business on digital. And what they're discovering right now is either some new needs right? Because of safety or supply chain challenges they're trying to manage. Um, but also what happens is when we've had, you know, McKinsey just did this study that they released and it's, you know, 10 years of, of digital transformation, right? And tooling happening in about a three to six month period of time. And when you accelerate that quickly, the sunlight shines through the cracks of where there's little gaps in those processes. And so, you know, for clients on that end of the spectrum and our customers who are operating there, you know, success is, you know, seeing where the sunlight is shining through and, and where they need to address that rather quickly. For some customers though, you know, this, this delivering in a digital world isn't the preferred mode of how to operate. And, you know, I think so classically of what's happening in so many healthcare circumstances, where you know, the optimal for most people is to see your healthcare provider in person. And now suddenly you might not have that choice. I mean, you might have been forced into telemedicine unless you have a really critical need. And I think the beginning of customer success and customer loyalty is really working with that customer to say, hey, your customer's trapped right now, okay? They don't have a choice to see their healthcare provider in person. Given that, you know, is that net promoter score or that customer sat you know, study relevant right now when they don't really have another choice. I mean, they're by definition trapped in an experience they didn't choose and you didn't design to accommodate this many people, you know, at this volume for this long of a period of time. And so in those conversations, I think it's so critical to ask and explore together, you know, what does success look like for you now? You know, you mentioned growth, Scott, as a lever here. It's, you know, how do we build your return to growth plan together? I think yeah. it's looking in the definition of it's okay that the, those benchmarks of customer success might look different right now. And you might need to establish a new baseline because the reality is we don't have the same number of choices. And therefore, I think we need to listen differently 
and redefine or step back and look at and be a thought leader in having those conversations about how do you measure success now for that business and who they're serving. Okay. I like what you say. So ask and explore, right? It's something I jotted down here is a, a nice way to maintain that. You know, Everett, similar to you, I mean, you're a people focused business, a relatively small company. I imagine that customer int- intimacy and trust and establishing that is really important for you. Maybe building upon what Karen was saying, how have you guys enabled that uh, for trust? Yeah, I was glad to hear those themes come in both Sally and, and Karen's um, uh, comments. So one of the things that we try and do is in some ways we insist on when we start an uh, engagement is how often do you talk to customers? Not the idea of a customer, not your belief about the customers, but actually engage them directly. And there are times that we will hear that they have, and then we'll still do a dis- what we call design and framing exercise, where we'll go and we will talk to various customers. We'll do, and often we just focus on learning and um, really looking at the baseline assumptions about what a customer does, wants, or whatever. And in this context of a pandemic, as Karen has just said, that stuff is different now. And so then we go on a journey with those customers, with the sort of our customers, with their customers in mind, as well as the operators of these systems. Everybody's probably been part of a organizational change process where you have a software basically foisted upon you and it makes things worse. It doesn't work very well. It slows you down. And then probably you haven't, you weren't actually asked what is the challenges with my system Um, And so we take that into account as well. The internal customers within a client, the external customers within uh, for those clients. And together, then we go on this journey to try and design a software product or software process that works for everybody. And usually that winds up uncovering a lot of really, really interesting things. Um, And then there's some technical parts to it, which is, you know, how do you do design in a remote uh, context? How do you build software? Um, where you can demo uh, on a regular basis what's been working, sort of the show, not tell mindset. And how do you gather multiple groups of people at the same time? So one of the things we talk about uh, very early on is the the pandemic will expose, as, as you said, cracks in the in the system. Well, one of the things we try and do is say, let's bring all the people from all the different sh- stakeholders together. So it's not just design, it's, it might be product, it's infrastructure, it's um, delivery, and get them in the room at the beginning. And then you start to see all the assumptions that people have never had a chance to, uh, to voice coming up at the beginning of a process. And now we're, now we're, we're cooking with gas. You know, now we're all being able to go forward together with those questions and those assumptions, and then be able to test and iterate and test and iterate until we find a signal. Um, And then when we find that signal, start to double down, build it up, scale, operationalize, and then automate. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you say it. I almost feel like we're accelerating some of this customer intimacy in a way uh, through these you know, being virtual or being in everyone's home and and seeing uh, distractions come through as we're talking about before. Um, so that's all great. Why don't we pivot now a little bit to talk more about business resilience in terms of our employees and managing their trust and their expectations. And, you know, some other stats that we have, some recent research here is, you know, we now have 53% of the world's population who never worked from home previously, who now intend to do so going forward, right? So these norms are, are shifting. Uh, the nine to five has sort of gone away. You know, and almost the same amount, 43% or so expect their work situations are never going to return to what was the normal. So let's talk about either the new normal, the never normal, or whatever it's going to be in context of our employees here. And, and Karen, why don't we start with you since you literally wrote the book on this. Um, and we also had a question from the audience, um, which is which is aligned with this, which is, you know, you, you talk a lot about balance and how we align around issues of family, overwork, and burnout. So could you maybe perhaps you know expand upon that a bit more? Yes, it was startling to me to read the recent Bloomberg study where people reported working an average of two and a half to three hours extra per day. 
uh, since the pandemic started and since it was work from home. I feel like we've gone through, you know, three phases. So the first phase was adrenaline. You know, we are fighting this unknown medical foe. We will keep ourselves safe. We will do whatever it takes to take great care of our customers, our employees, our colleagues, you know, whatever that looks like. And then adrenaline inevitably wears off. And then the next stage was the honeymoon is over. Okay. I, I can eat comfort food every day. Maybe that's not awesome. Maybe being at home and trying to balance work and e-learning isn't that fantastic. And always working isn't great. And now I think it's given way to how long is this going to last? And what I think is coming so closely with that is how do we live and work in a sustainable way? And what you and I might be willing to do when we think our circumstances are temporary, whether that's sitting in the uncomfortable, you know, antique dining room chair or working three hours a day extra seems okay when we think it's temporary. And when we start to realize it, it's more permanent. I think we're at this time where so many people are stepping back and saying individually as leaders and as teams, what, what adjustments are we going to give ourselves permission to make? And one of the biggest discoveries that I've had during this period of time is that, you know, with people having less experience working from home and with all the uncertainty, right, people want to keep their jobs, right? A lot of people don't want to be out looking for a job in this climate. What happens is your laptop becomes your pantry. You know, you go into the kitchen, you're going to refill your water bottle, then you kind of have a couple chips, a few of the cookies that the kids baked, maybe last night's leftovers or calling your name from the refrigerator. And, you know, you end up kind of grazing all day long, which isn't a healthy habit. And that's what's happening with work. You know, you walk by that laptop and you see it and you think, oh, I'll just do one more email, one more PowerPoint slide. And then suddenly you're grazing on work and wondering where all of your, where all of your free time went. And I think two critical things, you know, really need to happen at this point. So first of all, routines, rituals, and boundaries. You know, you might not have loved your commute in the Bay Area or wherever else you reside, but the reality is it put you in a mode that said, I have to do a certain set of things to get in the mode to go to work. And I have a catalyst, usually the traffic, maybe happy hour, maybe picking up the kids from daycare to leave work and leave it behind and mentally transition in and out. How can you put that in place in your home office? Next is putting work in its place. I mean, I was, I was shocked to discover when doing uh, the research for this book, still at this point, 72% of people are not working in a dedicated space and 28.5% are willing to report they're actually working from bed. You know, is that a tool to show up at your best? And then I think the last piece really from a leadership perspective is how do we step back, revisit expectations, and what success looks like and tie that very closely to messaging ownership, right? People need to be clear now on what the priorities are, the outcomes they're expected to deliver and what they're in a position to own and have autonomy over and being clear on those things. Plus the routines, rituals, and boundaries are really powerful tools for us to put and keep work in its place, but also have some energy in reserve you know, for the other parts of our life that we want to be able to enjoy. That's great. Thank you. Hey, Sally, maybe one for you. I'm thinking about your, your large global teams here, um, where frankly, the pace of recovery and reopening is, is different, right? You, you talked about your teams are a leading indicator in China um, that prepped you here in the U.S. a bit more. I guess maybe a question or like, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing here in terms of this constant course correction based on these various paces that different areas of the globe or even in the country are moving at uh, in terms of the return to work and how do you manage your employees through that? You know, and I'm, thanks Scott. I think Karen actually said it very well. You know, I think there was a lot of adrenaline and a lot of willingness to want to respond to the situation. But as it becomes a sustained reality, I think there's a need to sort of step back and make sure there's self-care and make sure there's also really high engagement. And so the reality is even some of the locations that have gone back to different degrees of normal is what I will call it if there is such a word um, anymore, there changes daily, right? Some of them have gone back and then some of them have reverted back to sheltering. And so I think there's, um, first of all, a new understanding of just flexibility um, in really being able to understand 
and Karen said it well, then what's the expectation? What do I need to, to own? And I think that starts, I, Everett and Karen both spoke to it. We've put a lot of constructs in place for our employees, which are just about connectedness, engagement, um, you know, wellness, a lot of resources that allow people to engage on those topics and recognize that they need to be thinking through them. So that's one level is just really making sure you're engaging people. But then I'll go a little deeper on something that Karen spoke to, which is you have to start to give your teams permission to draw boundaries and make sure you as leaders are being explicit about it and supportive of it. And, you know, on one hand with global teams, I've had some of my teams say it's wonderful because I'm not commuting. I can get up and engage with my team abroad and it's actually much more pragmatic. But then they need to make sure that's not a two extra hours on their workday that they then are drawing the line and having dinner, you know, in the evening with, you know, with their family. And I honestly think some of it is giving people permission and being explicit that that flexibility um, is okay and it should you should use it, but you should also make sure that it just doesn't become an and. Um, so it's a combination, I guess, Scott, is a long-winded way of, of answering that, of how do you make sure that you're explicitly, you know, encouraging people to draw those boundaries? How are you actually role modeling that across your organization? Um, and then how are you doing engagement in different formats? You know, engagement works for different people in different ways. But, you know, some of the few things we've done is also just carving out hours where we say there's no meetings, right? We've all been on Zoom. Zoom is a whole different level of engagement <laughs> where you're on all the time. Um, even when you did meet in the office, it wasn't that level of engagement. And so just saying there's hours where there's no meetings, where you actually can have space to think and, you know, move through your work um, or that you can draw certain hours and then just you know, frankly, casual engagement. How do you do fun things with your team that you just say, we're not going to talk about work for the next hour. <laughs> How do we just have that conversation? Um, and the last one I'll talk about, and Karen used a word um, that is really dear to me, is just authentic, right? We all have pets running through the background. We all have kids we're trying to balance. Um, and making sure, you know, and regardless of what your life situation is, everyone has many different situations, just making sure you're open. And that's the reality, right? We're all human. We're all managing different situations. Um, so I think there's a combination of factors that really help navigate with teams. Great. Now, Everett, you're, you're sort of old hat at this being working remote for eight years or so, you know, and I guess I think more about um, we're focused on self-care, giving people permission. What other tips or tricks have you learned along the way about, you know, team engagement and cohesion um, as you're building your business? Yeah, so the, the first thing I'd say is being an old hat makes me realize how much I don't know <laughs> more than anything, right? That's the journey of, of expertise. But um, I think what I, what I noticed was um, what we are trying to do is from the beginning, particularly we have an all hands meeting every week, even as we're growing and scaling and so forth, we, we quadrupled in the last two years. We always have a moment where each week we are talking and it gives the founders, myself, Jen Leach and Mark Forla, an opportunity to address really important issues. And so as things are being unstable, there's always a center where we can kind of bring everybody back and like, here's what we're doing. Here's what our purpose is. Here's what's important. And we get to show that weekly and then hear back from others as well. Um, so uh, the second thing we um, are noticing in terms of like addressing is um, as people are burning out, um, it also means that they can freeze. They can, especially leaders, like, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to work with my team, et cetera? So we give people what we call search time. We make it really easy that if you're working hard, if you're overworked, et cetera, no fuss, no must, just take it. Search time is really important uh, balance. And we've also noticed, I think, um, uh, it was mentioned earlier, I can't remember who mentioned earlier, where people are still going over and it's, it has to, it's really interesting to have to encourage people to take the time. Um, and so that's something that we can speak to. Um, other things that we do on a regular basis, particularly around keeping people connected, um, we actually have a facilitation guild and this is an employee group. Um, they formed it. Um, they are experimenting constantly with how to make meetings better, certain protocols, simply making things automated so we don't have to think about, is my mic on or whatever? We all screwed up anyway, but still it makes it a lot easier to, to, to have really good meetings. Um, documentation, 
we they are very um, specific about how do you document meetings. This is one of the things I think is underplayed when thinking about working from home or working uh, remotely is the replacement of that water cooler conversation or the whiteboard, someone has to take notes and publish them and make them clear and have clear action steps so that this coordination between people who are all over the world in y'all's cases or all over the country in my case, that can be documented. Um, there's a phrase that um, one of the folks who uh, is an astronaut, a woman, Katie Coleman talked about um, how they train to and how they focus Sorry, how do they train to be isolated for a long period of time? Well, the first thing they do is focus on mission and on purpose. So we're like, okay, we got that. And the second she thought she said was really interesting. She said, I know what my job is. So I do my job. If I have extra time, I will help somebody else do their job. And the third thing I'll do is if I get done with that, I will leave an artifact to enable the next person after me to do that job even better. I love that. That's sort of a, a, a very much something that everybody can make actionable in their own work. Um, and that's been really important. Then there's some fun things. Um, we have a trust radio hour, which is, um, we say it's neither radio nor an hour, but we introduce uh, someone who's a podcast host who's really good at it. We will reintroduce somebody who's been at the company for a couple of years and ask them questions about what are they most proud of when they, bef- of, what was the thing they're most proud of before the age of 16? Or where does their name come from? And they do some research and it's a really fun way to get to know people again. Um, And then we've had things like, um, I'll I'll do the last one, which is being humans together. Um, Each week, half an hour, um, just before our all hands is a time where it's optional. You come and you don't talk about work, but there's a prompt question. It could be, if you had to get up and leave the house right now, um, what would you take with you? Or tell me the story of that thing on your wall or grab an object uh, from your room and then tell us what it means. Give a story about it. Um, What was your favorite concert? And sometimes it's five people, sometimes it's 50 and we break out into rooms, but it's a way to kind of humanize each other. And by putting it in a program where it's a low lift, optional, but something you can really rely on is a great way for for people to, to, remain connected and anybody can do it and it could be expressed in one's own culture. This just works for us. Okay. That, that, that's excellent. By the way, we've got uh, quite a queue of questions coming in right now, uh, even more tactical around uh, employees and how we manage them in a work in a remote environment office space. I want to save that to the end because I do want to touch on sort of a third dimension of business resilience here, uh, here that we've talked about before, but or has been embedded in the conversation, which is really around technology, right? We talked about 92% of our companies accelerating digital transformation. Um, so I did want to spend a little time here just hearing from each of you, you know, how have you felt or ina- seen technology enable both, you know, engage with your customers or your employees, or what are some of the learnings along the way? Maybe Sally, we'll start, we'll start with you. Oh, great. So, and I think, you know, I mentioned a little bit of it earlier around the customer um, really using technology to make the interaction safe, make it also, and I think first and foremost, and Karen said this as well, where do you meet the customer with where he or she wants to come participate with you? And I think that um, is first and foremost um, for us. And so some examples of that have been those omni experiences, whether it's curbside or whether it's contactless payment. And then I think when it comes to the employees too, is figuring out what does everyone need to do their job? You know, and we were fortunate that we were through our digital transformation as it pertained to productivity tools. And that's as basic things of, can I access all my files anywhere, wherever I'm working? You know, can I, do I have video? Does that work globally with all of our teams, making sure everyone's on the same standard? And so we were very fortunate that we were in a good place with all of that. But it sounds simpler than it actually is when you start running global organizations um, at scale. And then the other one for us, and um, Everett touched on it, is both within our technology organization and the physical products we make, we have a product creation process. And that's usually very collaborative, use a lot of design um, thinking principles. And so that whiteboard where you have conversations and you iterate, can, you know, Karen mentioned it as well. So many of us, that's the way we interact and build on each other's ideas and not losing that in the formality of interacting remotely has really come. There's some really wonderful whiteboarding tools available. There's some really wonderful collaboration tools available. 
and how you bring those to bear in your organization has been really important because not losing that iterative thinking um, and learning from each other has really been something that's been front and center for us. So that just gives you a little bit of a sample. There's many different dimensions to it. Um, but it does require some thinking and constant feedback. What's working, what's not working, you know, what are you not using? Because sometimes you roll something out that you think is the perfect answer and no one uses it. And so understanding what's behind that and constantly working at it is important. Interesting. I, I ever actually in our conversation earlier, you were talking about how you can you've leveraged technology to iterate more quickly in a virtual environment with your customers as you're developing software. You want to expand a bit more on that? Yeah, no, I think it's also getting back to, um, you know, we're fortunate we've worked in an agile way for quite some time in our um, software development processes, but it's exactly that, putting that customer problem front and center and really just working through it, starting with what do you have, what do you not have? Um, and I think the other thing that's changed is a willingness to take more risk, right? Being able to take that risk on and iterate and go fast and it's okay if some of it doesn't work. Um, I think that's actually been incredibly empowering for teams. So not just only the technology, but also the process, and Karen spoke to this too, it's the process that has to go with that technology to truly unlock it. Um, so that's been a big part of, it, part of it too, is really letting teams have some degrees of freedom um, to come back with the best they can and also giving permission for it not to, be, not to be perfect, right? It's okay to iterate, to fail, to keep working at it. And I think that's actually cultures at their best um, as well. Great. Sorry, I, I had maybe a technical glitch on my side. I was attempting to divert that one or point that one to Everett. So that's Sally, thanks for the additional thoughts. But Everett, do you want to you want to share some uh, thoughts as well? Sally, you changed your screen name really quick, and you must have messed them <laughs> up or something. Um, so uh, for us, I think there's two things I'd, I'd focus on, and, and very much a lot uh, the same approach uh, that Sally just mentioned is is a lot of the core of us. But I'll, I'll highlight one other thing, which is enabling people to take risks means that you have to uh, enable people to have sort of a blameless, what we call blameless postmortem, a way in which mistakes are looked at as opportunities to learn rather than things to be punished or things to be called out. So for example, one of our clients um, early on had a process where they were only updating their systems once a year, super, super slow. Um, and you can imagine how debilitating it is for someone working on that system that if even if you see a change that you want to make, that's only been a year till you see it. It puts a lot of pressure on getting it right. So what we did was really start to build in agile processes and enable much shorter cadences. So we're releasing things two to three times a day at this point. And what it does is unlock this opportunity for people to take a chance, a risk, because it's a small change. It can be reverted, um, but then we can get the data and understand what we can learn from. One of the processes we use for that is uh, we use retros. Um, we used to do it for the entire company internally, but we also do it for our projects. And so now we'll have a sequence of a project begins and we will have a retro where we'll say what worked, what didn't, talk about the things that have the highest votes around, um, around uh, uh, interest, and then generate action items, not for blame, but for, oh, how can we make sure we do this twice as well? Or how can we make sure we don't do this again? And then leave an artifact so nobody makes the same mistake the next time. Awesome. All right, hey, Karen, do you want to wrap us out here in the technology section? I mean, obviously Salesforce has created products, right? To help enable in this, uh, this period of time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, actually going in a, in a little bit of a different direction with it, which is automation is a tool to combat burnout. Mm -hmm. And one of the most rewarding opportunities that I've had to be involved in from a technology perspective during this pandemic uh, is a large global organization who discovered when everyone shifted to working from home, their call center volume increased about 400 <laughs> percent almost overnight. And even after like the adrenaline or the initial panic wore off, sustained itself at 250% higher than their run rate. And in not surprising news, they didn't hire you know, a bunch of additional headcount in order to deal with that. And so as the senior executives you know, in the organization were thinking about how to solve for that, because 
you know, their employees were great at taking care of customers because they deeply cared. So even when the senior leaders would say, oh, we want you to work less or we want you to step away. I mean, people inherently felt an obligation to be helpful to customers. You know, it's core to how they're wired and what they wanted to do. And what we were able to work with that leadership team to do was really put some digital tools and technology in place so that some aspect of that, you know, case handling and interaction could be more digital, better knowledge management tools, and really being able to offload. And, you know, they started at the beginning and within about 60 days, uh, they were able to offload about 10% of their case volume. And they estimated, you know, they decreased their average employee workload by an hour a day. Mm. Sounds insignificant, but if I offered you an hour a day back right now, and as a senior leader, if you really use that as an opportunity to say, we're giving you an hour back because we put some tools in place. We don't want you to reinvest it in work. We want you to reinvest it in you. And what happened is it just became a powerful tool for that leadership team to really build trust and to put an action in place that really authentically communicated we're trying to think about every possible way, you know, that we can help solve for this. And when we're saying that we care about your well-being, we're investing in a way that that's showing up as you getting time back and having permission to step away and be more well. So, you know, I think that's the upside for as much as we can be hooked into technology, having us always be on. The reality was automation was a tool to help their employees be off. All right, excellent. Um, we have a few audience questions here and just a few minutes remaining. So I was going to pivot to those for a second. Um, you know, frankly, uh, a, a little tactical here, but I think some just base questions and I'll, let, I'll just throw it out to the panel here, whoever wants to respond. Um, one of the questions is, you know, for, our, for your employees, everyone who is wor working from home, are they receiving compensation for either the overhead cost of enabling that space or of using that space within their homes? Anyone want to jump in there? I'll jump in real quick. We created a budget a long time ago, but we created a budget for uh, enabling people to sort of optimize their setup. So whether it's a screen, whether it's a mic, whatever it happens to be, here's a budget. You spend it the way you need to, to uh, because you know best what works for you. Mm -hmm. We offer, we started with, for people who were officially designated as at-home workers before, there was a $250 stipend. When we made the shift, we increased it to $500 and made it available to all employees. It's got very similar to both what Everett and Karen has said and making sure people have all the equipment and the surroundings that they need to be productive. Got it. Um, and then obviously sort of being in San Francisco and the Bay Area broadly here, I think there's a lot of interest around, frankly, what's going to happen to office space here. Uh, so one of the questions that came through is, you know, do we anticipate are seeing a reduction in office space, maybe particularly in the Bay Area or San Francisco, as employees are more full-time remote. Anyone have a point of view on that? <laughs> yeah, it's a tough in the, one. Well, you know, here's what I'll share. In doing the um, in doing the research for the book, you know, it was over 60% of CFOs are considering making remote or flexible work a permanent option. Um, what I think is interesting, so it, it takes us to instantly jump into, well, therefore everyone will let go of office space or businesses who are struggling are going to let it go. I think with that, those statistics fail to consider. And as we sort of fill in the blanks on that story, is that part and parcel of keeping people safe right now is that when they return to the office, they need more space to spread out. So I think what I would challenge just a little bit is, does that mean a universal abandonment of real estate? Not necessarily. I mean, just like because Netflix is wildly popular doesn't mean people don't want to see movies at the movie theater. You know, in this in this context, what can happen is, you know, people may sustain those offices for a variety of reasons, but they may need more space or that same amount of space allocated differently to accommodate helping people be in person and work safely. Right. Yeah, I think it's interesting as well. We see the, the wide sort of spectrum of how individual companies are encouraging return to office where, you know, a lot of our sort of local companies here have put a standard in place, you know, not until the middle of next summer and so forth for, for the majority of the institutions. We see JP Morgan now, right, who made an announcement that the majority of their senior traders need to be in the office in New York as of Monday. Uh, I also see, you know, Reed Hastings at, at Netflix there is, is encouraging some more of the in-person. So it, it feels like there's going to be a, you know, you're right, commercial real estate is not going away, um, but it's, it's how it's going to be utilized, which could be changed. 
All right, great. We've got one more in here. Um, why don't we go with this one? The question, and this is, I think, back to our employees a bit. It's like, how are our companies dealing with the digital divide? I think it's probably in terms of enablement of our employees as well as like, what are we doing in our society here to, to maybe better enable um, folks that aren't as digitally enabled uh, as they're navigating through these times? Anyone want to take a lead there? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit. Um, and I think it's sort of one of the things we do a lot of projects that have, you know, sort of explicitly sort of positive social impact. And one of the things that we believe is um, a, the digital divide sort of making sure that we recruit uh, people who are not in the Bay area, don't look like the typical tech company, et cetera, et cetera. So expanding the ability to find recruit, hire and retain folks uh, has been really important to us from the from the beginning. Um, the second thing I think is, as we develop better systems, particularly in our work with public agencies, they are delivering essential services to citizens. And part of the digital divide is that some neighborhoods get these services and other neighborhoods don't get them. And so the ability to help agencies expand their mission by creating software that reflects the customers, is able to be delivered quickly, and frankly, is at a standard that people expect. Um, one of the things we learned with healthcare.gov was people are used to um, you know, Facebook interactions and Google interactions, but then they go to um, a DMV or something like that, and they get something that doesn't look so great. And it's sort of a matter of respect to say, hey, let's bring these modern techniques to these agencies and help them help them reach customers, and then hopefully get an interaction to come back as well. Uh, and I think that's the approach that we take with a lot of our work. And I think there's going to be some really interesting opportunities because people are trying to figure out how to deliver services now. Um, and now we have a lot more tools. I mean, the, the people on the uh, you know, Karen's Alley, uh, they've been developing a lot of tools internally. And then how can we kind of combine to create those experiences for, for customers and citizens, frankly, citizens um, around the country. Excellent. Yeah, you know, creating an economy at the scale, you know, kind of matters there. I, I would just add quickly, I mean, I see companies, it doesn't always have to be formally organized, but when you can solve for helping people get more adept at digital tools and the fact that people are feeling isolated and invisible, great ways to do this are small communities of people where people can train each other. Right. Somebody who's a digital native is happy to connect with and share their expertise with someone who's not. And while solving for the, the tool competency and capability, you're also solving for the bigger topic, which is feeling isolated and invisible. You know, it's a tool for connection. Excellent. All right. Limited time here. So final question. I want me to do this as a rapid round robin here um, for, for each of you. We've actually you know, this conversation broadly has been very positive. And I, I want to make sure we sort of leave this uh, discussion on a positive note as well. So, so really the question is, given everything that's transpired over the last six months and all the change and the uncertainty going ahead, what are some of the changes that you're most excited about? Uh, and what, what do you plan to sort of implement in the next six to 12 months? Maybe Sally, start with you. Um, no, thanks, Scott. It's a great question. I think first I would go back to, um, it's really changed new ways of uh, working. And I think a couple of times you heard a number of us say the innovation that's coming out of the organization when you've really um, pushed down and democratized people's ability to solve problems through the incremental connectivity. And it's just, it's been really amazing to see. It's been great to see people fostering those relationships, building it, and then really going after um, problems. And I think pre keeping that culture alive and keeping that um, spirit alive is really one of the great outcomes and then just the acceleration of using technology to really meet your customers where they want to be. And I mean, what Karen just said is really what it's all about. How do we get people connected in Everett's comments about how do we get people comfortable with technology? Those are some of the trends accelerating that I think really are here to stay. And how do we keep building on those in a constructive way as organizations is amazing. Great. Karen? Success is not a location. And with everyone universally going to work from home at the same time, it's leveled the playing field on. You're not more in the ins and more successful if you're in the office 
physically versus in a remote office or you're at the headquarters location versus somewhere else. And I think closely linked to that, what I'm really excited about is when people have the flexibility to take their work to other locations and to other cities, I think it's a path to really a more sustainable future for everyone. I mean, if I chose to live in a small rural community and do my job there and I pay taxes, it feeds a better education system, healthcare system, food options, you know, distributed work is really a tool to a more sustainable future. That's excellent. Actually, you know, one thing that our CHRO is pushing inside of Accenture is like, you know, skills are really now the new currency, you know, so you remove all the others and it's just back to, to core skills there. So that's great. Everett, you have the chance for the final words here. Uh, I wish I could plus one. All the comments <laughs> have already been made. It, uh, it's been a pleasure being on this, on this channel. Um, I think the opportunity is we get to recognize that complex problems defy sort of command and control, linear optimization uh, mindsets. And there's no playbook for the pandemic or the racial reckoning or the Western fires. And frankly, all of this is a, is a dress rehearsal for climate change. And so what I'm really hopeful for is in doing this acceleration that we have an opportunity to change our mindset. Um, I've been working on a framework that's called Move to Edge Declared Center. And a lot of that is about saying, I don't know the answer, but we can actually figure out a process by which we can come up with new ideas, A. And B, it's not just the leaders, it's people who are closest to the problem. I think Sally said this really well. People who are closest to the problem have access to the information. So um, that is, I think, a really big opportunity to engage a lot, new, lot more new people. And so as Trust, what we're doing as a, as a company is continuing to push forward with our clients and our customers and implementing those sorts of iterative discovery and then uh, scaling and operization processes um, to see if we can actually push forward and solve some of these complex problems. That's great. Um, however, unfortunately, we have reached the end of today's program. We have run out of time. I'm sure we could keep going for, for quite some time. I've personally found this extremely engaging and, and, uh, and a learning experience for me. So I want to thank all of our panelists, Sally, Karen, and Everett. Thank you so much for your participation here, uh, as well as thank the audience for attending. I do want to highlight if you've got any additional questions that we either didn't get to here and you're looking for a response, please post them on the Facebook event page uh, that will be up for a period of time. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.